Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. I wanted to introduce... Uh, someone who has created a fantastic podcast on YouTube. Uh, his name is Ahmed Ahmed from the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy. And the next five days, you're going to hear one episode each day. And I encourage you to go to his channel to subscribe at Your Pop, Y O U R P O P. Uh, it stands for the Your Pursuit of Purpose podcast, uh, where he interviews successful people and how they got down their leadership road. Uh, so hopefully you'll subscribe. 2,000 people already have in the last month. And uh, here we go. Hey, guys. Welcome to Episode 3 of the Your Pursuit of Purpose podcast. Today I have the honor of interviewing Lillian Sanchez. Yes. And she's here with us today as a new graduate from the University of Iowa. Recent graduate, yes. Yeah, she just graduated how many days? A week ago? Um, I want to say four or five days ago. Four or so five days. Very recent. Yeah, so congratulations Thank on you. graduating. That's awesome. And so a little bit about Lillian Sanchez is that she's a first-generation college student from Des Moines, Iowa, who graduated with degrees in both ethics and public policy, as well as a second major in political science. So kudos to you for doing that. <laughs> that must have been a little tough. <laughs> and Lillian has contributed to the University of Iowa community, uh, serving in various leadership positions. So in April 2017, she was elected as the vice president of the University of Iowa student government, which is huge. And the first woman, first Latina woman to serve as the vice president for this organization ever in school history. <laughs> <laughs> so through the position, she has continued to advocate for the first for first-generation college students mm -hmm. and students with marginalized identities as she began doing uh, after her first year at the University of Iowa as a Iowa Edge peer leader. Mm -hmm. And most recently, uh, Amnesty International selected Lillian as the latest Christoph Memorial Fellowship. Yes. She got selected for that fellowship through a 10-week residency program where she will work to advance human rights with a global team of advocates. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> and when do you start that? I move out um, to California June 1st. June so 1st. So just right around the corner. <laughs> oh, that's most exciting. And California. And California, yes. yes. I've never really been out there, so. I can tell you it's beautiful because I've definitely been there. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So Lillian, we can just go ahead and get started. What i like to do first is just introduce the person I'm with. So maybe you can just give us some background, mm -hmm. who Lillian was before she came to the University of Iowa, or maybe maybe even before I, I was a state, because you're an immigrant. Yes. So yeah, you can just give, tell, tell the audience maybe your story a little bit. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, first off, thank you so much for having me here, course, and I want to say thank you also for putting together such an important um, avenue for people to share their stories, especially for underrepresented communities and especially for immigrants, um, to talk a little bit more about our stories, about our stories of perseverance and resilience and how we too deserve to live a life of dreams that we make for ourselves. So I appreciate that. It's so impactful. So thank you. Huh. Um, I think, you know, to start off, like you mentioned, a lot of these accomplishments are amazing to hear just from here and I'm extremely humbled. Um, but I think uh, a lot of the times it comes back to really thinking about how is it possible that all of that is made possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't think of all of these things without thinking about my family um, and without thinking about the people that have come before me in terms of those trailblazers that have made it possible for me to have a story um, of success, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it weren't because of my family, I don't think I would be here. Um, I am originally from Mexico, so uh, my family and I um, are from a small town called Atlacomulco near Toluca, Mexico. Um, and I grew up in Mexico until I was about seven years old. Um, you know, went to school there. I really got to absorb the culture. And then at seven, we moved to the United States um, to pursue a better life, just like many other immigrants. Um, it was an unsafe situation for my family to be there, and we needed to find somewhere where we could pursue our dreams in a way that was safe for ourselves, for my mom, my sister, and I. 
Um, so when we moved to the United States, we moved to Des Moines, Iowa. Um, at that point, a lot of my family had already been here, and so we heard about the incredible opportunities that Iowa had um, for us family members, and we decided to come and join them here. And I think from the very beginning, Iowa had just been extremely welcoming. Um, that doesn't mean that we didn't experience any sort of challenges or circumstances during that time, um, but it just made sense for us to come to a community where it very much was, um, was similar in the way that we had grown up. People were welcoming. They wanted us to... Um, pursue our educational opportunities and at that point in time I was the first person in my family to truly pursue an education here in the United States wow. um, and so while I was doing that you know my mom was working here and there trying to make sure that there was enough food for us at the table and a shelter that we could live in and um, I think the only way that I could really try and feel like I could help support our family is to do what I knew best and it was to become a good student. Um, so that one day I would be able to go to college and somehow be able to repay back all of the sacrifices that my mom made for my sister and I. Mm. Um, and so that's how we got here to the U.S. I grew up mainly um, between the Des Moines and the West Des Moines area. Mm. I went to um, elementary school, Capitol View, then West Des Moines, um, Fair Meadows, and pretty much grew up in the West Des Moines School District. Mm. Um, and there we were, you know, introduced to a lot of different opportunities. And I would say that um, in addition to family, what has also really help me be a better individual and a better member of society have been um, mentors and mentorship. I know that without the help of people who took me out of their, their wing or who took the time to really help me and recognize that my family was struggling and that we needed help, um, I wouldn't be here without them. And so um, whether it was teachers, members of the community, um, members that we just knew that helped us, I think without them, you know, our, our stories wouldn't be as successful as they have been. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's one heck of a story. <laughs> <laughs> and can you tell us maybe kind of your situation? So after you guys immigrated and you were living in the Des Moines area, because you told me a little bit about it, but maybe you can tell everyone just so they can appreciate really like how you grew up and what situation you came, especially like with you just it was you're just your mother with you guys. Yes. Right? Yep. So. Um, so like I said, when we first moved to the U.S., we grew up in the Des Moines area, um, and the Des Moines area is definitely I would say much more urban in a way than a lot of different places here in Iowa, especially rural yeah. Iowa. Yeah. Um, and so luckily for us, we were in a community where there were other Latinos and other immigrants mm -hmm. um, from different parts of the world um, who were settling in. Um, but in addition to that, because it was a very much low income um, area, you could see a lot of poverty, and we experienced, um, you know, a lot of um, poverty, but not in a sense that we were extremely lacking, but we definitely, there were a lot of circumstances that we, you know, we went to local food pantries, and we went to the local community centers where we would pick up clothing um, to be able to kind of make it through, and so when we first moved here, because I didn't know the English language, um, I got held back a year. Um, and then during that time, I spent um, almost all of my academic time in ESL courses, um, where I tried to somehow be at the same level as everybody else in the second grade, second to third grade. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I was learning English, I had been held back from my studies. Um, and so I was, in a way, you know, I lost a step in that yeah. direction. Um, and through all of that, you know, my mom would be working in the mornings, um, in the afternoons, and at night, so we would rarely ever see her. And I became almost like a second parent to my sister. Um, in times that my mom wouldn't be here, I would babysit her, and we would make sure that we, that she ate breakfast in the morning, that we'd, walk, we'd take ourselves to school and whatnot. Mm. Wow. Wow. So you guys can see, like, it's a lot of people don't understand the true immigrant story, especially those who really haven't, didn't have to go through immigration or maybe they were born into a family where they were very well off right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So just the things that we can appreciate, just like how you mentioned, just the background. So therefore, when you see people that are struggling, you can kind of empathize with them, yeah. which most people can't do. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very valuable in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and without a doubt. And kind of so just transitioning from all this. So you went from Des Moines, then you came to the University of Iowa where you completed your undergraduate studies. But something that you, partake, uh, you partook in was student government. Mm -hmm. And not only did she partake in student government, but you ran for vice president. I did. <laughs> and you also won yeah. and were elected as VP yes. of the student government. So can you kind of just tell us the process of 
what really, what was your motivation? Because if you're not 100% motivated, that's, you just get, you know, because it's politics. Yeah. And that's tough. You just, I can tell you firsthand that I've seen people, like, how they try to campaign and all these things. <laughs> and they'd come to me in the library while I'm studying. Hey, vote for me, vote for me. So can you kind of just tell us what was your motivator throughout your was it your junior year that you were? Yeah, it was my junior year going into my senior year. And that's a tough time to be in school, too. Yeah. Because now you're an <laughs> upperclassman, so you're taking on this tough uh, course load. So kind of just tell us about how you were able to balance <laughs> school life as well as you running for a position in student government. Mm-hmm. And then also thereafter, not only did you campaign and all that, but you were elected yeah. for the position you were running for. I mean, it's hard, I think, to sit in this position now, having gone an entire year in serving, you know, in a position like that and think, wow, I can't believe that I thought that I couldn't do this. Mm. Um, And I say that because I feel like, especially under, especially for communities of color and for women of color, a lot of the times when we think about opportunities that present themselves, the first thing that we do is we question whether we're worth it. And we question whether we have the abilities to do something. Um, Or if it's maybe something that, you know, would be beneficial for us if it's worth our time because our family members have sacrificed so much. Is it going to be worth me, worth for me to take the time to want to do a certain thing? Mm. Um, But I think that, you know, having seen my mom and um, my family experience a lot of these um, circumstances where our family was greatly impacted by policies and by politics. I mean, when you talk about the immigrant community, when we talk about communities of color, Mm. for so many years, especially in the United States, we see these communities be scapegoated in situations and in circumstances for things that we haven't done. You know, we talk about violence and we talk about um, terrorism and we talk about all these different issues that have nothing to do with the immigrant community. Why don't we talk about the hard work that we put in? Why don't we talk about the amount of sacrifices that our families go through to make this country great? Mm. Um, And so I think that because those conversations are not had at the national level, at the federal level, and they're not put at the forefront of these table topics, Um, then a lot of the times we're to blame, you know, immigrants communities are to blame and people of color are to blame. And so it was so important for me to understand that our stories matter, that raising our voices about our struggles and also about our accomplishments and our triumphs is important so that we're recognized and we're no longer sitting in the shadows of people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I didn't grow up with politics. My Mm -hmm. mom, in fact, um, most of the time avoided talking about (laughs) politics because every time she would see the news or every time we would go online or the newspaper, we'd see conflict. Um, But I I was like, why can't we figure out a way to make politics um, serve in a matter of humanity and serve under this idea of human dignity and preserving human dignity and ensuring that every single person is protected um, by the law instead of punished by the law. Um, And so, you know, I'm pre-law. I want to go to law school at some point. I want to use the law to help protect individuals and to help them through their struggles and the things that they face. Um, But we can't do that unless, you know, we ensure that there isn't injustices that are avoided. Um, And with politics, a lot of the times, um, you know, it starts out in policies and in the law to make sure that these communities are kept um, safe and that are kept protected and that are and that we you know benefit off of the things that so many other people do as well yeah so I hadn't ever seen myself in that position before um, I had been extremely involved as an undergraduate you know I had been part of a photography club for the first year I got onto campus <laughs> I um, was involved with the alternative spring break trips where we would take week-long trips to different parts of the country and work on different social issues. So I took a trip to um, Buffalo, New York. I took a trip to Detroit. Um, And then we did uh, one last one in Columbus, Ohio, um, whether it was urban development, criminal justice system. A lot of these issues made me realize that the problems that a lot of our communities here face are faced everywhere. And that we're not unique in the sense that, you know, only some of those things affect us. Like, they affect everybody. Nationwide. Mm -hmm. And so I saw this opportunity as a way for me to have my experiences, to have my story, and to have the stories of so many other people like me be told um, and be prioritized in those nation-level conversations that I was just talking about. 
Um, and, you know, I was extremely blessed because, and I always say this, and I hope Jacob Simpson is watching this because he was my partner in crime <laughs> yeah. this entire time. And I was really blessed with a team that advocated for me and that advocated to ensure that my voice was heard every time we were in a meeting with either administration or with state legislatures or even with other students. Um, I It was so helpful to have someone be there for me and make sure that my voice was heard. Mm -hmm. um, and so when Jacob asked me to run, you know, obviously I questioned if that was something that I should be doing. Um, but there were so many people that were rooting for me and I feel like at the end of the day I needed to root for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's anything I think out of this entire conversation that I hope people take is that we need to recognize our own potential. Um, we need to recognize the sacrifices that so many people before us took and did. Um, and really own that as our own identity and realize that just because nationally these conversations make us feel less than doesn't mean that we're less than. It just means that we're that much more uniquely positioned to make a change in this world. Uniquely positioned. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's really well said. It is. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, we all have the potential for your positive change. And it's up to us to really activate that and to not let everybody else around us tell us we can't do it. We have to give ourselves permission and then just go for it. It's just your passion. That's you were following your passion. That's exactly what it was. There you go. And that's what it really takes. I think a lot of people get into politics without really having a passion for it. Mm. And that's a mistake. Anything you do in life, if you don't have a passion for it, you're not going to, first of all, you won't enjoy, enjoy what you're doing, right? And second of all, you're, gonna, you're not going to be successful at it either. Yeah. What, you're going to always, you know, just take the easy way out or take the easy route, maybe not study for whatever subject you're studying for because this can kind of be applied um, just anywhere it can be applied in all aspects of life so you saying that just just you know were you telling me about how passionate you are about all these politics and po just the policies and law it all makes sense now yeah. to why you were successful well, because of passions yeah exactly i think it's the passion and i think the other thing too is when we think about politics and when we think about public policy mm -hmm. we forget the fundamental idea behind all of this and it's public service right and you elect individuals to serve communities and to serve you. Mm. And so when we no longer think about politics and public policy in terms of service, and we only think about power grabbing and conflict and whatnot, we lose the idea that at the end of the day, these individuals are elected to serve the community and to make our community a better place for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that having that passion for our community to do better and for support towards one another to ensure that everybody has at least somewhat of a path to their own success um, is extremely important. And we can't, I think, regardless if you're in politics, if you're in policy, if you're in engineering, if you're in a STEM field, for example, I think, I think at the end of the day is how do all of these fields come together in a way that we contribute to our society in a positive manner? Um, and when we focus on that, I think then we're able to have impact and um, and change that's much more intentional. Yeah, no, without a doubt, absolutely. Wow, <laughs> need a moment after that. It's true, <laughs> it's definitely true, definitely true. But I mean, just with regards to everything else, uh, and again, I do wanna thank you for coming on today and kind of sharing your story and letting everyone know who Lillian really is outside of just double majoring and <laughs> all the successes. You can see people that are successful, most of the time, the most people that I've met most of the people that I've met in my life who are very successful have had a struggle mm. in some, some way, shape, or form. If it's environmental struggles, if it's financial, if it's just, doesn't matter if they're an immigrant or not, it just, they had something that happened in their life that kind of, it's, they, again, it gives them that passion deep down inside. They're like, okay, this is my motivator, my driver. Mm. That's going to push me every day to make sure I, I succeed in whatever, I, whatever endeavor I'm committing to. Yeah. So for you with politics, just growing up, you have your whole story laid out that follows kind of the journey that led up to this person who I'm sure will be a lawyer one day. <laughs> I hope so. No, without a doubt. And uh, Lillian, what I do at the end of each podcast is I ask whoever I have on just to leave the audience members or whoever's listening um, with some advice. So something that, uh, that you want to leave them with to pursue their own purpose. Mm -hmm. It could be a child that's watching. It could be an adult that's right now maybe finishing up college, maybe a graduate. Just something that you want to leave them with or something that you hold near and dear to your own heart. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. That is such a <laughs> loaded question. <laughs> it is. It is. 
Out of all the pieces of advice, um, yeah, I you feel can, like... Multiple things is fine, too. Multiple things. Okay. Yeah. I feel like the one thing that I kind of already hit on um, and talked a little bit about that I oftentimes, you know, stop myself and really think about and remind myself is the idea that each and every single person that we know of um, has potential. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you talk about potential and, like, potentiality, it's such an ambiguous term. You're like, what does that mean? Um, but I think that... With passion, like you mentioned, um, we have a potential for anything that we want to do. Yeah. Whether we want to express ourselves creatively through a podcast or by drawing and painting, or we want to pursue a passion through helping others, whether it's through politics or engineering or the sciences. I think we all have potential, and it's up to us to truly want to activate that um, and to set that forth. And I think at the end of the day, we have to remind ourselves of our self-worth Mm -hmm. um, of the fact that we are all human beings and we all have potential for greatness and we have to just encourage one another but above all encourage ourselves to want to pursue that and to give us um, ourselves permission to do that for everything that we stand for right. um, so a constant reminder that you know we need to have confidence in ourselves and our skills and what we're made of and know that um Nobody knows us except ourselves, and we can't be our own biggest challenge. So, All right. believe in yourself. Yes, I really lo I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot, and it's true. It's so cliche, but it's it's the truth. It's the, it's definitely the truth. I yeah. would say. So again, thank you, Lillian, so much for joining us today, and I'm I'm sure everyone's gonna really love your story and also just appreciate everything that you had to say. Just going out there and letting us know what you're, who Lillian really is before. The successful person she is today. <laughs> so again, thank you so much, and good luck on your um, residency fellowship. Yeah, fellowship. The fellowship that's going on in California, which is in about a week and a half or yeah, so. Yeah, already so, uh, happening. Yeah, so good luck with that, and hopefully we can have, I'm sure people are going to want you on another time, so maybe we'll have you on another episode. I would be flattered to be back. <laughs> All right, and thank you guys for thank tuning you. in with uh, your Pursuit of Purpose podcast episode three, and I'll see you all, all, I'll see you all on episode four. Little tongue twister. <laughs> see you guys. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag #PharmacyLeaders. 